Here we have a basic, simple example displaying the roadmap style of map. And what I'm going to do is open this map up in its own window so you can see that this is what the roadmap style of map looks like. And if we right click on the background, I can do view page source. And the approach for doing that varies from web browser to web browser. In this case, I'm using Chrome, but the right click on the background will often provide you access to be able to view the source code for the page that you're looking at. You can also often go to the menu in your browser and within the menus, there will be an option to also view source for the page that you're working with. So here we have the entire set of HTML and JavaScript and even some styles that define that interactive map that I just showed you. So let me just walk you through the content of this page so that you can see essentially the elements that we're working with in defining this uh, interactive map page. I'll make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. So as we discussed last week, we start with the HTML element that essentially wraps the entire page and all of the content of the page. We then have the head element, which is this block of HTML right here that contains a number of key components for this page. First, we define a style for the page that really sets some background characteristics in terms of the HTML block and how it should be, in this case, how its height should be defined, the body block and how it should be displayed, in, including the background color for the body area of the page, the color of text, that's what this color element here is, and then the alignment of text within the page here with this text align center attribute. And then we are also defining a style for this map canvas element. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is a way of attaching a style to an element within the body of the page where we will display our map. And I have just chosen to give that element an ID of map canvas. And as you hopefully remember from last week, the way to attach a style to a particular element with a given ID is with this hash ID name selector. And then you can specify the style information that should be attached to the element with that identifier. So in this case, we're defining that the map canvas element should have a width of 90% of the window size, should have a height of 80% of the window size, should have an automatically defined left margin and an automatically defined right margin. These can then be the foundation for a style that you might want to apply to your um, initial maps, but this is a nice way to start. What you, can, what you then need to do is define the necessary JavaScript to create your map object. And that really consists of two steps. The first one is to link to the Google Maps API JavaScript code. Because Google has essentially written a huge block of JavaScript that sits behind the scenes providing all of the interactivity and the interaction with Google servers. So when you're writing your JavaScript using the Google Maps API, you're using 
elements from this JavaScript code that Google has published in your definition of your map interface. But the first thing you have to do is link to Google's JavaScript code. And you, use, you do that using this script block right here, where we were saying that this is a script of type text slash JavaScript that's basically saying what language that script is in. And we're here specifying the source of that script. So we're referring to an external JavaScript file that we want to read the contents of and include the capabilities of in our web page. This is something that you're going to have to do in every web page where you're wanting to integrate a Google Map. Without this, your Google Map will not work. And then here we have a closing tag for the script that provides the, the balanced complete block of JavaScript that brings the, Java, the uh, Google Maps API into our system. We then have a second script where we actually write our JavaScript code that defines the map object and links that map object to an element within the web page. So this is a critical part of your web page that really does the hard work of defining what the map should consist of, configuring the map object, and then linking it to the rest of your page so that the script knows where to display the map. So let's go through this step by step. We have defined here a function in JavaScript called initialize. This is a way of essentially wrapping all of our JavaScript in a block of code, a function that has a name, in this case initialize, that can be executed at the time that is appropriate in when the page is being loaded. And I'll talk about that time in just a minute. Within this initialize function, we then have all of the commands that define the configuration of our map object. So the first thing I'm doing within this function is defining a variable, where in this case, this variable is being given a name classroom. So I can refer to the contents of this variable using this name classroom. And this variable contains a Google Maps latitude and longitude object that represents this coordinate pair, this latitude and longitude value. We're going to then use this variable name as a shortcut to define the center of our map object. So right now, this is just a way of connecting this Google Maps object that we're creating, this new latitude longitude object, to a shorthand name, classroom. So we're going to now create a second variable, in this case called my options, where we set our options that we want to define for a new map. So in this case, again, thinking about the required information for a Google map that I was just talking about, we're going to create a name value pair here called zoom with a value of eight. So we're defining the zoom level of the map object that should be created. We're defining the center of that map object as classroom, where again, remembering that classroom is this Google Maps latitude longitude object that represents this coordinate pair. So that's a way to have a reusable named object that represents that location in space. And we're defining an element here called map type ID that is set to 
this google.maps.maptypeid.roadmap. So this is defining the type of our map as roadmap. So we've now created a variable for our location. We've created a variable for the options to be used for the, creating the map. We're now going to create a variable called map that is a new Google Maps object. So this is actually the definition of our map object. And as a part of the creation of this map object, we basically provide two values. We provide the element that we want this map object to be connected to. So this is an element within your web page that you want to be essentially the container for this map object. And this phrase that I have selected here, document dot get element by ID, where you then provide the name of an element, this right here in quotes is the name of the ID of the object that we want to connect this map to. Okay, so unless that object has already been created in your web page, you will actually get an error when this JavaScript is run. We also now have this my options element, which is essentially this list of options that we defined right here. So this is a way of separately defining all of the options essentially as a list of name value pairs where we can just use the shorthand for those options here in our map definition. We could also, when we're defining the map, actually just include this information between the curly brackets, including the curly brackets themselves, in this line that creates this map object. But for readability and sort of part maintenance of the page, it's much easier to actually define the options separately and assign them to a variable name that you can just then include in the text that you're using to define your map object. So that is the end of our function. And one thing to note here is that the entire function is defined by these opening and closing curly brackets. If you don't have those brackets matched up, you're going to get an error. And that's a common and easily made mistake when writing these, this code out. So we have the second script object that defines a function called initialize. As I mentioned earlier, if you try to link this map object through this phrase right here to the map canvas element, if that element has not been created yet as the page loads, you're going to get an error message. So the way we handle that is through the use of the definition of an onload event in our body. So as you remember last week, when you create your web page, you have your style and script information that you put in the head of your page, and you put your content and structural information in the body of your page. When the body has finished loading all of its content, this onload event will be triggered. We just talked about events previously. In this case, what we're doing is we're attaching a function to this onload event where that function is this initialized function that we developed right here in the head up above. What that does is it delays the execution of that block of JavaScript until the body has finished loading, which means that it will be delayed until the div that we've assigned this ID of map canvas to, it will be delayed until that object has been created in the page so that our map object can be attached to it. 
So there is an important sequence that has to be followed when creating your map object or writing your JavaScript to manage that map object is that while you can write your JavaScript and place it in the head of your page, you can't actually execute the JavaScript that has to be attached to objects in your page like the map canvas div until the rest of the page has loaded. And that's why we are defining this initialize function and then executing that initialize function when the, finish, when the page finishes loading. You can see here that the body of the page is incredibly simple, where we basically have an H1 header and a div, where that div is given an ID that the map object will then be connected to and that the JavaScript will then fill with the interactive map. So now that we've looked at the code behind this, let's look at the page again. And you can see that basically we have here at the top, this is that H1 header, just called sample map in this case. And then this area where the map appears is that div that was given that ID of map canvas. And that's it. The structure of the page only consists of essentially two elements, a header and a container for the map. The JavaScript is handling all of the capabilities for the interactivity of this map in terms of the ability to pan, either using the hand tool or using the pan controller up here, the ability to zoom, by just clicking on the zoom control here, the ability to choose the different map types. So this is, in this case, I just chose a terrain type. Or I can choose a satellite type. I can turn the labels off and on. This is essentially the equivalent of the hybrid map type and this is just the satellite imagery in terms of the way this particular set of controls are presented. But all of this interactivity is being handled by the JavaScript that is a part of the API that Google has provided. And we have essentially only had to provide the information necessary to define our custom part of the map, where we would like the map to start in terms of the zoom level, where it should be centered, and what object in our interface that map object should be connected to. So let's go back to our slide. This is an example of, again, a simple map that displays, in this case, the satellite information as the base map. So let's open that up in a new window again, just by clicking on this link within the slide. This is our default view of the map based upon the definition within the JavaScript for the map object. If I right click on the background of the, of the page and choose view page source, again, we can see the source code here and I'll make this a little bit larger again. And the source code here, and I'm not going to go through it and all step by step again, I'm only going to highlight the one change that was made from the previous source code that we worked with. In this case, in the options for the map object, instead of the map type ID being roadmap, the map type ID is satellite. This is the only change that I needed to make to change the default map from the roadmap to the satellite mapping style. Other than that, everything is the same. The styles that I defined for the page and for the map canvas 
the link to the Java, the JavaScript Google Maps API, the definition of the initialized function that contains the definition of our map object and the command that links that map object to our document object element named map canvas. And then the body that defines just those two simple elements, the H1 and div, that is given the ID of map canvas. So just by changing that one value in the options for the map object, we've changed our map from a road map to a satellite map, as simply as that. So if we go back to our example, Again, you can see in the slide the source code that corresponds to this satellite map, and it's showing that same only single change. If we move forward to a hybrid map example, again, hopefully this pattern is becoming clear to you. This is the hybrid map, and again, as I showed you earlier in the current Google Maps interface, that is basically a way of, of toggling this labels checkbox check on so that the roads and labels we, will be displayed in combination with the satellite background. If we look at the source code for this hybrid map, we again basically have the exact same page except for this map type ID value that in this case is set to hybrid. That's the only thing that has changed in this page. Other than that, the HTML and JavaScript is exactly the same. Our styles are the same. Our script uh, link to the Google Maps API is the same. And our body is the same. Our final example in terms of our simple map types is the terrain map style. So if we view this in its own window, you can see how this map style really highlights the variations in the terrain as opposed to the satellite type that shows you know, more vegetation and uh, developed urban areas. The emphasis here is more on the shaded relief depiction of the landscape, providing a much clearer view of what the shape of the land is uh, within the map interface. If we view source for this page, you again can see everything on the page is the same, except for this map type ID that in this case has been set to terrain. Everything else is unchanged. The styles, the link to the Google Maps API, and the body area. So just by changing this simple parameter in the definition of the map object, you can fundamentally change the type of map that is being displayed. And move on to some other modifications that you can make in the configuration and what those modifications look like. In this case, we have gone back to the hybrid display type, but we have changed the zoom level. So if we view this in a new window, you can see that as opposed to the very large regional view that we started with as the default value in the previous maps, in this case, we're centered over a part of the University of New Mexico campus. And we have also chosen, as you can see, through the combination of the labels for the roads and the roads themselves and the background imagery, that we're using a hybrid map style. And you can see that again in the controller up here as we have the satellite map type chosen. We also have the checkbox for labels selected, which yields us that hybrid map type. If we view the source, for this particular page, we have essentially two things that are changed from 
the code that we've looked at for the previous pages. The first is we've now set the zoom level to 18 for this particular map. So this is a way of setting the default zoom level for the map that will be displayed. And in this case, 18 is a very localized zoom level. And we also have set the map type ID to hybrid, providing that combined view of the satellite imagery and the labels and roads. Other than that, again, the structure and content of the page is the same. Here, what we can look at are some examples of how you can modify the interface elements themselves as they're presented to the user. So as an alternative to the larger, more complex controls that we were viewing in the previous um, map examples, this is going to show some changes to the controls that are displayed to the user um, in an effort to simplify or streamline the user interface. So if we view this in its own window, you can see here that we have the zoom control, which has been made much smaller, so we no longer have that ruler that essentially connects the plus and minus zoom controls. This is just a, a small form of that. Um, you have the different presentation of the map op options here, so it's a more compact pop-down list as opposed to the side-by-side -side listing of the map options. Um, and those are the key attributes that have been changed in this particular um, map interface. You can see we're still using the hybrid map style and we're still at that very localized zoom level of 18 in the map that has loaded. So if we view the source code on this, you can see that we still have our style defined, we still have our required connection to the um, the uh, JavaScript API from Google, but we have modified the script that defines our map object with some additional options for the map object. Where previously we had defined this zoom option, the center option, and the map type ID option, we now have five other options that we have also defined. And as you look at the documentation for the Google Maps API, you will see that there are required options, essentially these three that we started with, but there are also a large number of optional values that you can also provide to further define your map. In this case, we are explicitly setting some options for the zoom control. So that's what we have right here, where we have two options that are defined, zoom control true, where that is basically saying display the zoom control. So regardless of what other op uh, options may be set, let's explicitly ensure that the zoom control is displayed. And then we also have zoom control options where we are defining the style of the zoom control. In this case, to the Google Maps zoom control style small. And that produces that compact zoom control that we were seeing in the map with just the plus and minus buttons um, on, on top, stacked on top of each other. We now also have, related to the map type control, an explicit setting of true for the display of that control, and also the map control options that provide additional detailed information about how that map type selector should be displayed. And in this case, we're setting the style to drop down menu. So that's defining how that map type control should be displayed within the interface. This is essentially overriding the default display of that map type control. And finally, you may or may not have noticed in this particular map, 
the street view control is not displayed. Um, if you look at the previous maps, you'll see that there is a little street view control that looks like a little stick figure over in the upper left-hand corner of the map. In this map, we have suppressed the display of the street view control by setting this option of street view control to false. So that's a way where we can both explicitly enable and disable particular elements within the user interface. So these are additional options that we have provided as a part of this my options variable. So that essentially the content of this variable is larger, but we're still then just using that variable as we execute our standard map object creation function here. So we're creating this map object and defining its creation using this my options list of options that we've created up above. Other than that, the rest of the structure of the page remains the same. We have this simple body that consists of a header and a div with an ID of map canvas. So with those options, we can go back to the map and understand that we turned off the street view option, which had been appearing over here in the left-hand corner with some of the other tools. We had defined and modified the display of this zoom tool. So now it only shows a simple plus and minus stacked on top of each other, where the previous map had shown a connecting sort of ruler between them that indicates visually the zoom level that is currently active. And we've modified the map type selector so that instead of that horizontally oriented selector, it's more of this drop down style of selector for the user to interact with. So those are some tools for being able to modify the sort of layout and background content of the page in terms of the base map types and default view characteristics for the map that, that you're working with. We're now going to start talking about a number of overlay types and, and talking about how you can define them to be able to add them to your map as additional information above and beyond the base map that Google provides. And the first overlay type that we're going to talk about is markers. So these are, again, markers of point locations within your map that you want to highlight for some reason or another for the users. So if we view this in its own window again, you can see in this map, I've created two markers. One that's approximately located uh, near my office and one that is located over um, what had been our previous uh, classroom location before we started to develop the online course. So in this case, I have these two markers that you can see are anchored to the rest of the map because they are defined using geographic coordinates that the map interface is able to link to the underlying uh, base map that is being displayed. So if we view the source for this page, you can see again in the head area, our standard style and initial script to connect to the Google Maps API JavaScript but we now have a larger block of content inside our initialize function where we are defining some new values. You might recall in our previous uh, maps, we had already created this variable called classroom. And we had linked to that this latitude longitude object that defined a set of coordinates for that, that classroom variable. And we were using that to define how the map would be centered. 
What we will see now is an example of how we can reuse that variable for other purposes. We've also now defined a second variable called office that is based upon another Google Latitude Longitude object where we specify another coordinate, a new, another latitude longitude value pair that is connected to this variable called office. We're creating our basic map options variable. In this case, this is back to our very basic um, settings of just the zoom set to a zoom level of 18. The center value, which is set to the classroom variable, and the map type ID of hybrid. All things that should be fairly familiar to you now. And we're creating our map object with the name of map and defining it through a connection to the map canvas and the options that we've created. So far, this is all basic stuff very much like we've been talking about for our simple maps. But now we're going to extend the model by defining two markers. And you define the marker by doing two things. First, creating a variable that you give a name. In this case, it's, we're calling this one classroom marker. And you create for that variable a Google Maps marker object using this function that I have highlighted here in the slide. And then you assign two values for that marker. First, a position, where in this case, we're using the position that we defined up above for the classroom. So by using essentially that classroom variable, we're referring to this Google Maps lat long object that we created up above. So we're able to reuse that object since we attached it to a variable name. We could also directly add this google.maps.latlong coordinate function here in place of the classroom variable that we're using. But again, for readability and for maintenance and management, this is often a better way to define your markers because you can then more easily track and manage those variables and you can reuse them more easily. And in this case, we're also setting a title for our marker that as you might have noticed as I hovered over those markers in the map, then become pop-up values so that you can display some simple information about those markers when the user hovers over them as a default behavior within Google Maps. Once you've created this classroom marker variable that is a marker object, the next step to actually display that marker is to attach it to a map object. And you do that here using this classroom marker, marker, which is the variable that represents that marker object that we just created, dot set map, which is basically a capability of that mar marker object, where we then tell it what map object we want to link that marker object to. So in this case, we're attaching it to our map object named map. Remembering up above that we, when we created our map object, we created this variable called map. That's what we were referring to because that map variable is our shorthand reference for the map object that we created. This would allow you to possibly even have multiple map objects within a single page, each of which has their own variable, their own name. In this case, again, we are attaching this classroom marker using the set map function to connect that marker to our map object named map. 
Similarly, we're going to create a second marker object, in this case named Office Marker. We're going to create that marker object again using this new google.maps.marker function. And we're going to define for that uh, marker object a position, where again that position in this case is using that office variable, which we defined up above as this Google Maps lat long object that I have highlighted here, defining the latitude and longitude coordinates for that lat long object, and defining a title for that marker as well. Those are two uh, characteristics of that marker object that will be created, just like we had those similar characteristics for our previously created marker object, where the name of this marker object is a, again called Office Marker. Like our previous classroom marker, once we have created that marker, we have to attach it to a map object before it can be displayed. So in this case, just like our previous marker, we refer to the variable name office marker. That's essentially the pointer to our marker object. And we're executing this set map function for that object marker, which requires us to provide the map that we want to attach that marker to. And in this case, we're attaching it to our map object named map, just like we did for the classroom marker up above. This results in what we see in the map here, where we basically have two marker objects that are anchored to our map object and displayed at the position that we defined. And as you hover over those markers, the titles are displayed. So let's now extend this with the integration of a polyline into our display. So if we open this up in a new window, you can see that we still have our two markers, but what I've now done is defined a linear path that connects those two markers. In this case, it's an approximation of the walking path between my office and the previous classroom for this, for this class. So let's view the source for this page and make it a little larger. See that the style and initial script for the connection are, remain unchanged. And move right here again to the initialize function where the all the work that we've been doing thus far has been taking place. You can see that we still have this classroom variable that defines the coordinates for our classroom. We have our office variable that defines the coordinates of the office. We have this my options variable where we're defining the options for our map object. We have the creation of our map object itself using the options that we've created up above and linking that map object to our map canvas div element down in the body of our page. We have our two blocks of creation, then attachment code for the markers that we created in the last example. So here's our classroom marker code and our office marker code. So that's all stuff that we've seen previously. Now we're going to talk about the block of code that defines our path. And this process should hopefully becoming, uh, be, be becoming a little bit more familiar as it's, it's, the, it's conceptually very similar for everything we've been doing so far. So in this case, we're going to create a variable called office visit coordinates. And that variable consists of a JavaScript list 
of Google Maps latitude longitude objects where you know that it's a JavaScript list by essentially these square brackets at the beginning and end of the list of comma separated values. And our goal here is to essentially create a variable that includes the sequence of latitude longitude values that we want to use to define the path where we are again reusing two of the points that we've created previously our office point defined up above and our classroom point and we are now in this case directly creating additional lat long point objects or lat long coordinate objects as a part of this list of coordinates that we want to use to define our path. So in this case, this list of coordinates that we're going to use and define for this variable consists of office, this new lat long object that is located at one geographic location, the second new lat long coordinate defined at another geographic location and then at the ge then finishing with the geographic location that's associated with our classroom variable so this is just a list of points but we can then use that list to define our polyline which is what we're doing right here where we're creating a variable called office path right here and that office path variable is a polyline Google Maps object where we set a number of characteristics for that object in this case we're defining the path for that polyline to the variable that we just created that is that list of coordinates called office visit coordinates here we're also defining what the color of the line should be. In this case, it's basically a shade of red. The opacity of that line, which ranges from zero to one, where zero is completely transparent and one is completely opaque. And the stroke weight of that line, which is essentially the thickness of that line. Those are all values that you can define for this polyline to control both where it is and how it should be displayed. And you can see that basically all of those options are contained within these curly brackets that define a JavaScript dictionary that consists of names and corresponding values separated by commas. Finally, just as we did with the markers, once we've created this office path variable that represents this polyline object, we can then attach that polyline object to a map. And just as with our markers, we refer to that polyline object by name, by the variable name that we've attached it to and use this set map function for that object and then specify the map that that object should be attached to. In this case, the map object that is associated with the variable named map that we created up above. And that results in the display of this polyline object here as a part of our overall map display and and as like the markers you can see by the fact that the the polyline is defined using the same coordinate system as the rest of the map that it is anchored to the background uh, layer the background image Let's now talk about the polygon overlay type, where you can see here that instead of the polyline, 
we've now defined a polygonal region that has both a defined boundary and a fill, where this is a closed geometric object that is defined by a series of points. So we can view this in a new window so we can see the broader context for this. And then we can view source on this to see what it looks like as we're defining this polygon object. And this should hopefully be fairly familiar to you now as the pattern remains the same as what we've seen earlier. So as we scroll down to the initialize function, we still have defined our classroom and office variables. We defined the options for the map. We've created our map object. We've created our classroom marker and our office marker. And what we're going to be talking about now is the code where we're defining the coordinates for our polygon, just as we defined the coordinates for our polyline, and then using those coordinates to create our polygon object. So in building our building coordinates and constructing our building coordinates variable, in this case, we are just constructing this list of coordinates, this list of Google Maps lat long objects. And so you can see I'm creating this new variable called building coordinates and assigning it, starting with this square opening bracket, a series of these new Google Maps lat long objects, all of which are separated by commas. You'll notice that the first and last coordinates, so this coordinate here and this coordinate here, are not the same. Though your polygon is a closed feature, Google Maps automatically will close the feature for you by connecting the first and last points to close your object which is something you want to keep in mind as you define the series of points so that you don't end up with something odd in terms of uh, a strange line that crosses through your polygon uh, that does not represent sort of the shortest path between your first and last coordinates that you want to use to define the polygon. So here we've essentially defined a series of points using this Google Maps lat long uh, function. And this has created this list of coordinates, this list of lat long objects that we can then use to build our polygon object, which is what we do here with this creation of a new variable. In this case, we're calling this variable uh, BLDG poly where that new variable is a polygon object that we define with this google.maps.polygon um, string. And then we're defining the characteristics of that polygon object with this series of op options that are surrounded by curly brackets um, for that, that polygon function. So here with the paths, option, we're basically pointing to that building coordinates list that we created up above as the sequence of latitude, longitude locations that represent the boundary of that polygon. You can potentially provide multiple paths or multiple um, lists of points for this path option if you needed to create a multi-polygon but we're only here illustrating a, a simple polygon uh, for this example. Just as with the polyline, you can define a stroke color. In this case, this is again a shade of red. The stroke opacity, so this is again the opacity of the boundary line for the polygon. In this case, it's slightly transparent with an 
opacity of 0.8, a stroke weight of 2. So these are all, again, attributes of how the line surrounding the polygon should be displayed. And here, since this is a polygon, we have additional parameters that we can define in terms of the fill color, which is the same shade of red, but it actually looks different because we have also set the fill opacity to 0.35, which makes that fill color much more transparent. And as a result, it looks different from the same color that's being used for the surrounding line. Finally, once we have created this polygon object, just as with our previously defined polyline and markers, we have to attach that polygon to a map. And we go through the exact same process of referring to that polygon object by name, dot, the set map function, and then specifying for that function the name of the map object that we want to attach that polygon to. In this case, again, our map object that is attached to the variable called map. Nothing else has changed in the structure of this page other than essentially defining that polygon um, and attaching it to our map object. So if we look back here, again you can see this polygon that is defined by that series of points with the boundary of that polygon as this fairly opaque shade of red and the fill of that polygon being a lighter shade of red that is really created through its increased transparency. The actual color specification is the same, but due to the transparency, it looks lighter. Finally, let's look at the process for adding an info window to your map as a way to provide more structured or um, just additional information about the objects in your map. And while the info window that we will be developing is a very simple one, given the fact that you can actually um, have an info window that can contain uh, just about any HTML you can develop, you can imagine how complex you could uh, make the content of the information that is presented in the info window. So let's view this page in a new window. And in this map, I have attached an info window to this classroom marker. So if I click on this, I then get this window that displays some information about that particular object. And so what we will show here as we look at the source code for this example is how to create the info window object and then how to link it to another object in your interface to then trigger its display. So if we view source for this particular map, we can scroll down to our initialize function and we can see all of the materials that we've already created. Again, our marker locations, our point definitions, the options for our map, the display of our markers, the creation and definition of our polygon, the linkage of that polygon to the map. That's all of this that I've highlighted here, which is the same as what we've seen previously. And what we're going to focus on here are these additional JavaScript components that define the content of our info box, create the info window object, and then link using an event listener, as we talked about events briefly earlier, this is the one instance where we're going to be uh, using the event model to uh, connect content to other material within our map, uh, to basically use the event to attach the display of that info window to an object in the map interface. So let's go through this step by step. First, 
we're defining here the content of the info window. And the way we do that in this case is we're just writing HTML. And what we're doing here is we're basically creating a text string that is going to be connected to this class info content variable. And that text string is the definition of the HTML that we want to have displayed in that info window. So what we're defining here in this case is several lines of text that we want to have combined together into a single text string that is the content of that window. So here I'm creating a div, an HTML div, just like we've seen um, before the standard HTML, that in this case I'm assigning a class of info box to, which would then provide me the ability to define a style for it later if I'd like to. I'm creating a paragraph that contains some text that I want to have displayed in the info box. And then I'm creating a closing div tag to wrap it all up within that div that I'm creating. The plus signs that I have at the end of each line here basically tells JavaScript that I want to continue this text string on the next line. That allows me to not have just one long block of quoted text, but instead I can have line breaks between the parts of text that I want to combine together to make my code more readable. The plus signs, again, just say, take this line and combine it with the content of the next line, where each of your text strings have to have quotes around them, either single or double quotes. I'm using single quotes in this instance because I also am using double quotes inside my text here to define my class name, and so, I, since I want to use double quotes inside my div definition, I'm using single quotes to define my entire, entire text string. This is something you want to keep an eye out for as you're creating text strings in JavaScript or any other programming language for that matter, is how you're using quotes and making sure that you're not accidentally um, combining single and double quotes in ways that are going to break up your uh, text in odd ways. So in this case, I'm using single quotes to define the text content for each of the three lines that I'm creating here that will ultimately produce this long, longer text string that can, can, starts with the opening div tag, contains this paragraph element, and then has a closing div tag. So this is just a text string that is associated with this class info content variable. I'm now going to create my info window object by assigning that to a variable called class info window. And I'm doing that by creating this new google.maps.info window object where in this case, I'm just setting the content of that object to this class info content variable that I created up above. Again, this is a way of separating sort of the definition of that variable from the use of that variable uh, here in the definition of our info window. We could potentially put that string, develop, string content directly here in our um, info window object creation code, but it would make your code a little bit less readable. So again, we've defined the content outside of that and we're just using the variable that points to that content here in the creation of our info window. And that's the only setting that we're using right now in creating that info window object. Finally, we're going to attach that info window to an object in our map so that it will automatically be displayed when the user clicks on that object. And that requires us to use 
the event listener support in the Google Maps API to essentially listen for a specific event and then take an action based upon that event. So in this case, we're using this google.maps.event.addListener function. And we're basically saying, use this object to use this object name as the object that we're listening for this event on. So in this case, we're using the classroom marker object, which is the marker that we have that we want to connect this to. We're saying, listen for the click event for that object. So basically when somebody clicks on that object, where that object is here, the classroom marker object, when somebody clicks on that object, execute a JavaScript function. Where in this case, we're defining the JavaScript function using this structure here. So we're basically using an anonymous function that contains then the one command that we want to use. So the way you do that is just this function open close parenthesis and then these curly brackets that contain the actual JavaScript code that you want to execute. This is just a JavaScript syntax model for being able to define one or more JavaScript commands that you want to execute as a part of this function. In this case, what we're going to be executing is the open command for this class inf info window object, where again, that is the info window object that we created above that contains the text that we want to display. That info window object has an open function that then defines both where that info window should be displayed in terms of the map object where it should be displayed and the location where that info window should be displayed in this case in this case at the classroom marker location remembering way back at the very beginning we defined this classroom variable with this coordinate and we created this classroom marker as being associated with a particular position so that information is propagating down here where we are saying open up within the map object named map at the location of the classroom marker object this class info window info window object. So this is all of the information needed to then display that info window at a particular location within a specified map. And the rest of our, our code here remains unchanged from what we've looked at previously. So if we look back at our map, we can again see that we have our polygon, we have our markers. If I hover over the markers, I still see the title information that has been provided. But if I click on this classroom marker object, by clicking on it, I'm triggering that click event associated with that marker. And when that click event takes place, the JavaScript that has been linked to that event is executed, where the JavaScript in this case involves the display of the info window that we created.